Uh, hi to everyone. My name is Andrew. I'm, I'm a member of uh, the Workers' Solidarity Movement, which is an uh, Irish anarchist group that's been in existence since about 1984. Uh, and this is stop 32 for me on a 44-city speaking tour of uh, North America. So, in the last 15 or so years, anarchism has grown pretty significantly across the globe, uh, both in terms of the numbers of people who call themselves anarchists and in terms of geographic spread. There's either the emergence or re-emergence of anarchist organisations in countries where there haven't been for some time. But a general problem is that the growth hasn't yet meant the emergence of, an anarchist, of anarchist organisations capable of making a real sustained contribution to struggle, nor has it yet seen the creation of a popular understanding of anarchism um, among ordinary working people. If you stop the average person on the street and ask them what an anarchist was, the best sort of response you might hope for would be something to do with summer protests. Unless we get beyond those things, we're kind of stuck in the role uh, we've had since the defeat of the Spanish Revolution. And that's as a sort of consciousness of the revolution we left. You know, the anarchists are the people who say, well, if you do things that way, it will turn out badly. All too often we're correct in that, but, you know, there's not a whole lot of comfort in it. You do get some anarchists are happy with that limited role. The odd summit protest coupled about giving out about what the left is up to can be a fairly comfortable zone to be in, providing you don't get arrested at that summit protest but it also leaves you pretty ineffective in the fight for a free society. So what I'm going to be talking about, and I'll talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, is the anarchist movement in Ireland. Uh, two reasons. One is the obvious one that's where I'm from, but the second one is, in my opinion, in the last decade it started to break out of some of those limitations, and as a result it's becoming quite a significant force. One measure of this is that anarchist mobilisations are no longer just a collection of alternative types but increasingly look quite like the ordinary people you see on the street. The image behind me uh, is of a 5,000-strong uh, demonstration in Dublin on May Day 2004, which had been banned by the police, and I'll get back to this later. Another measure of the spread of, of anarchist discussion or, or, or anarchism is uh, the way the media talks about it. Previously, anarchism was unmentioned as a political idea. If you saw, you know, if a newspaper used the word anarchy, they used it to mean chaos, so, you know, anarchy in Somalia type headline. Uh, today, though, that's changed quite a bit, and it's not all positive. Uh, I've got three sample sort of stories here. Uh, the first one, Irish anarchists so see a flower power. It's kind of a piss-take article, you know, having a laugh at anarchists. It's actually based around a community gardening project. Uh, the one at the bottom, we'll gas Bertie, is pretty much the complete opposite. Uh, the Bertie is Bertie Ahern, who's the, who was the Taoiseach in Ireland until last week. Uh, he, he took rather a lot of money off businessmen and it finally caught up with them last week, so he had to resign. Um, but uh, that's the equivalent of the US president. And uh, this newspaper had discovered a supposed plan to gas not only him, but also 10,000 other people as well. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, that turned out not to be true. Um, and the third story, in some ways, is a more positive one. Uh, what the image is actually a reply we wrote to uh, an article in the major Sunday newspaper. Um, and what that article was trying to say was that anarchists were the secret manipulating force behind a popular community struggle uh, around local taxation. And I'll talk about that in a while. Some media outlets have some sort of commitment to giving both sides of the story. And uh, anarchists have made use of that, which meant we've become a not that uncommon feature on the main television chat show, on radio, and various documentaries and news items. This also brings problems with it. Uh, another Sunday newspaper uh, got annoyed uh, with one of these people doing a good job and decided they'd try and get her fired. Uh, the children this paper are worried about, by the way, are university students. Uh, uh, and you'll be pleased to know they didn't manage to get her sacked. Lastly, though, and more importantly, anarchists have become the leading force in terms of some popular mobilizations and a significant force in most others. And that's what I'm going to be concentrating on. I think that's the important story. Now, things were very different a decade ago. The anarchist movement is quite new in Ireland. Uh, the, in terms of continuous presence, it's only really since the 1970s uh, that organizations have existed. And by the mid-1990s, they were still very, very small. Uh, essentially two small organisations, one in Belfast called Organise, half a dozen people, the photograph was one I took while doing a talk on the Spanish Revolution, um, and then my own organisation based in Dublin uh, called the Workers' Solidarity Movement, you know, probably about ten people in this period. Photograph is more or less from the same time, about six months later. Now, even though small groups had achieved some things, abortion is illegal in Ireland, 
Um, and as a group, we were active around this in Dublin with some other people. And in 1992, a 14-year-old girl became pregnant as a result of rape. She wanted to go to England to get an abortion, um, and the, the courts put an injunction on her to prevent her leaving the country. Uh, now, because we were active on the issue and basically leafleting in the street that Saturday, we realised that people were really angry about this. Uh, so we called a sequence of demonstrations, which the following Saturday culminated in one of 15,000 people. Um, and that, that pressure and the pressure of the other stuff that had happened that week uh, was enough to, for the courts to actually reverse the decision and allow her to go. A second significant struggle in the same period uh, was uh, community-based and around taxation issues. Um, Ireland, like a lot of countries, is seeing a shift from progressive taxation, that's where the more money you earn, the more tax you pay, to various flat rate taxes, where everybody pays the same, regardless of whether they're earning 10000 a year or a million dollars a year. Um, and the main way the government have introduced these is by bringing in charges on what were previously free public services, so things like water supply and refuse collection. Um, so in the mid-1990s, uh, they tried to do this with regards to water supply, and we were part of a left coalition uh, that built a mass-based campaign. 60,000 households were paid members of the campaign. That's about 20% of all housing in the city. Um, and the main strategy was non-payment, and then when the uh, government reacted to the non-payment by trying to cut off individual water supplies, uh, we were able to mobilize neighborhoods to physically block access to the stopcocks. In the few cases, they did manage to get access it was possible to reconnect people, and then when they tried the next obvious thing, which was taking people to court, uh, that's why it was a paid membership campaign. It was about $5, and all that money went into the central fund. And what we did with that is we would defend every case in court on any possible technicality. Now, that wasn't so much because we expected justice from the courts, but that meant instead of being able to hear a case every five minutes, a case would take several hours. Uh, the result of that was within a month there were 400 cases, the district courts, the lowest level of the courts were completely clogged up and the judges started to refuse to take any more additional cases. The government was then forced to actually abolish that tax, so that was a victory. What I'm really going to be talking about though is the period from 1996-1997 on. Uh, and the reason I'm starting there, well, there's two reasons. One is it's when the anarchist movement starts to grow, but the second reason, and related to it, it's also the period in which the globalization movement or anti-globalization movement starts to emerge. Without quite knowing what was going to come, we got involved in some of the origins of this. I was at the International Encuentro in Chappas in 1996. Other members took part in the European March Against Un Unemployment in 1998. And at the European level, that was a very important sort of networking event as well. Um, and we also took part in the Bradford Conference in England of that year. Uh, that led to the J18 action against the City of London. That's when 20,000 people gathered in one of the central London train stations, went down to the financial district and tried to storm the futures market. Uh, they also opened up the fire hydrants in the street. And it was kind of significant because it was the first sort of uh, mass direct action protest around globalisation in the north. So in Ireland at the time, the movement's still pretty small, so people are doing that, you know, going to summit protest stuff that people were doing everywhere in this period. Um, and the other thing that was happening uh, was an attempt to get a Reclaim the Streets uh, movement going. Now, this had been tried in the, early, in the late 90s and wasn't terribly successful because there were too few people. Basically, a dozen people would gather, try and block a road, the cops would arrive, three people would get arrested, say everybody else would be pushed off the road, and it would be over in five minutes. But with the growth of the movement around globalisation, uh, suddenly there were a lot more people willing to do this sort of thing. So in 2001, there was the first successful one with about 1,000 people, and in 2002, there was the second successful one with about 2,000 people. <laughs> The 2002 one was going to be significant for another reason, though, um, and that's towards the end of the day there was a police riot. Now, if you were watching the film footage that I showed out there earlier, uh, one of the films shows a lot of cops kind of knocking the crap out of teenagers on the street, and that, that's from that event. So what happened was the police initially put out a story that we had tried to have a riot and they'd successfully put this down, and the mainstream media faithfully reported this story in the 6 o'clock news. The other thing that had happened in the same period, though, was the growth of an Irish indie media. It's quite a solid one. It's still going. Uh, through that, that footage you saw went up on the indie media site uh, within about an hour. And rather surprisingly, the mainstream news organizations actually took the footage and rebroadcast it on the 9 o'clock news as the first item. Uh, the other surprising thing they did was they actually included the indie media logo and web address at the bottom. Now, they only made that mistake once. <laughs> But what that did, because the footage is quite graphic, uh, 
uh, you couldn't really tell in the grainy version, perhaps, but uh, perhaps so, uh, was it created this big debate about policing in the country. I mean, the physical suppression of demonstrations by the cops wasn't unusual. What was unusual was being caught on camera in this manner. Um, and typically what would happen if that happens is you'd call an anti-brutality demonstration afterwards outside a police station and, you know, 20 or 30 leftists would turn up. But this time, because of all the media coverage, uh, 3,000 people took part in the dem- anti-police brutality demonstration that Monday outside the main police station in the city centre. The other significant thing, though, about this uh, was in terms of media stuff. Obviously, there'd been all this media coverage of the footage, and the media were very interested in talking to people who'd organised the event. Now, at the time, we had a kind of traditional attitude within the movement at that point of, well, we don't talk to the mainstream media. But the problem was that that meant that the reasons why it, why it had happened and what exactly had happened wasn't being put across from our point of view. And we also actually had the problem that one of the um, authoritarian leftist parties actually put people onto the radio station claiming to be the organisers and, you know, kind of put the, putting their spin on it. So, as you might imagine, that annoyed people. So... During this week, we're kind of arguing this out, and towards the end of the week, we say, OK, we'll actually we'll give it a try. We'll go on to, uh, we'll try the mainstream media. And what we decided to do was to go on to uh, a live television chat show, uh, which is called The Late Late Show. And it goes out on a Friday evening, and loads and loads, maybe 60, 70, 80% of the population watch it. Now, it's kind of funny as well, because it's really not very trendy to watch this thing. Um, I was one of the people on it, and I went into a shop the next day uh, to get something. And the guy behind the counter was like, don't I know you from somewhere? And then he twigged as to where he'd seen me before. And he was like, oh yeah, I was just flicking around last night and I happened to come across that. But uh, the significance was that lots of people actually really did see this. Um, And so what it meant was maybe they'd heard a little bit about anarchism in connection with footage from Seattle or the riots in Prague. But now for the first time they had identifiable local anarchists on the television explaining their ideas. And, you know, perhaps doing an okay job of it. Uh, The other significant thing, though, was in terms of the movements because we'd had that whole debate, and what it meant was from this point forward, we were really quite focused on creating quite an outward-looking anarchism, Uh, one that sought ways to communicate with ordinary people, to explain what we were about, what our demonstrations were about, why we were taking particular courses of action. So in Ireland, around globalisation, you have the, um, and this is pretty typical, I think, of everywhere, you have an initial coalition of groups, Um, And as is also typical of a lot of problems, the coalition is problematic because there's a kind of single authoritarian left party that effectively controls it. Uh, And that meant that if we made decisions they didn't like, they just never got implemented. They vanished. So people were complaining about this, um, and we took the initiative of saying, okay, rather than just complaining, let's consider making an alternative. Um, And out of that, the grassroots gathering came. So what the grassroots gathering was, was basically a sequence of of meetings, of conferences, right? They'd happen every six months, and they'd happen in a different city. And they were open to anybody who agreed with the set of principles we drew up together. And that that was really important because what it did was it brought lots of people together for the first time. You know, like the the very small movements and uh, people had started to find out about anarchism through the net and everything else. And this was a way for them to meet up with each other for the first time and to have discussions. The other significant thing about the gathering, though, uh, was that each gathering would end in a, a big discussion circle. And what we'd often do out of that is uh, discuss actions. What did we need to be actually doing? So quite a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about actually came out of those. There were two other significant struggles in this period. The first one I like to call the Empire Strikes Back. Uh, and what that was, was the government's coming back at us in relation to this community taxation issue. They'd been defeated... Uh, previously, but so this time they had a new idea about it. And what they did was, instead of introducing a water tax, they introduced a refuse charge. Now, this had a couple of advantages to them. With the water tax to, st- for, to protect non-payment, all we had to do was stop them disconnecting people or reconnecting people if they managed. With the refuse charge, all they had to do was stop collecting people's refuse. Right? Now, obviously, if you live in a city, your refuse isn't being collected. That reaches a critical point pretty soon on. So it would be quite an effective way of making people pay. A lot, again, as a coalition of left groups, we built up a massive non-payment campaign. About 80% of the city wasn't paying. Um, and then after about three years, uh, the government started introducing this non-collection strategy. So we knew this was coming. So the strategy that had been agreed was as soon as they stopped collecting anybody's refuse, we would blockade the refuse collection across the whole city, bring the whole city refuse to a halt. And that, the idea of that was that was going to force the government to give in. The uh, the problem, though, for us as well, was this time they prepared a good bit more repression. So what they did 
was they got a court injunction that said anybody who interferes with the collection of refuse can be thrown directly into jail. You don't even need to go back to court, first of all. So within 10 days, we had 22 people jailed in connection with that for a month, um, including a nursing mother. And obviously, the purpose of jailing her was to demonstrate that they were quite willing to jail anybody. In that context, the campaign fragmented. In some areas, they managed to impose non-collection. But in other areas of the city, including the bit I'm from, which is about 40,000 housing units, five years later, I'd say it's still about 60% of people haven't paid, and they still haven't introduced non-collection there. So it's kind of like a draw, and we're waiting to see what happens next. Second issue is uh, going to be a more familiar one to you, and that's the so-called war on terror. Um, Ireland is in a kind of funny position. Uh, you know, if you go to George Bush's office and you open up that drawer in his desk where he keeps the coalition of the willing list, you won't find Ireland on it. And the Irish Constitution says we're neutral. Uh, but the reality is that uh, there's an airfield at the west of, in the west of the country at Shannon that's the main supply route for sending U.S. soldiers from the U.S. to Iraq. In fact, thanks to various court cases, and I'll talk about those in a minute, we now know that a million U.S. soldiers have flown through that airport, either coming to, going to Iraq or coming back from Iraq. It's also been used for CIA rendition flights and for munition flights. Um, so this has been going on for a time. I remember during the first Gulf War, marching around with a placard in Dublin that said, no refueling at Shannon. But Dublin is about seven hours bus journey from Shannon. Shannon's out in the countryside. It's uh, about 40 miles from the nearest town. And the left never did anything else about it. So at the start of the Afghan war, there was one of those grassroots gatherings, and at this, the discussion at the end is, well, can we bring the sort of direct action methods of the globalization movement, the sort of stuff people have been using at summits, to this question, can we end refueling this way? Um, and so we decided to have a go. So the, this picture is the first demonstration at the airport uh, in the summer of 2002. The local police at this stage were not used to demonstrations. They tried to stop us getting in, and we just shoved our way through them, and I think had some sort of die-in outside the terminal. It's fairly small scale. Uh, one thing I will do with the picture is this woman here with the red hair. She's called Mary Kelly, and I'm going to return to her in a minute. By the period leading up to the Iraq War, the anti-war movements had started to grow, and basically we were having some sort of action at the airport every month. And on October the 8th of 2002, we had about 300 people down there, and towards the end of that day, some anarchists took the initiative of pulling down a section of the airfield's perimeter fence and leading about 100 people onto the airfield itself, uh, forcing its closure for a couple of hours. So as you might imagine, this caused a huge debate, both in terms of media stuff, but also in terms of the anti-war movements. Uh, was this, some, this sort of thing going to alienate people and stop them marching, or was it a way of, of having some sort of effect on the actual question of refueling? What did happen, though, was the anti-war movements continued to grow, and also the protests at Shannon continued to grow. So in early January 2003, uh, 3,000 people take part in a protest down there. There's another attempt at occupying the airfield itself. That doesn't come off. And what happens instead is a sort of spontaneous occupation of the rooftops. Uh, so the photograph here is showing a couple of cops with dogs trying to stop people climbing up onto the rooftop there uh, unsuccessfully. So all the rooftops get occupied by people again for a couple of hours. Again, lots and lots of debate around this. So this intensifies, though. Uh, January 29th, that woman, Mary Kelly, climbed over the perimeter fence at the airfield, found a U.S. Navy jet on the, on the ground, and disarmed it by hitting the nose cone with an axe. Uh, they flew a repair crew in from Fort Worth in Texas. They put the plane back together. And then on February the 1st, five members of the plowshares climbed over the same fence, found the now repaired plane in a hangar, and this time caused $2.5 million worth of damage by hitting the nose cone with hammers. Uh, I can give you the names and stuff because the strategy both Mary Kelly and, and that, that group followed was to then hand themselves into the police and to try and defend themselves on court, in court on the grounds that their actions were reasonable in order to save life in Iraq. Um, so those court cases are interesting. The Plowshares case, it collapsed twice before it went to a final trial, and the first collapse is interesting for two reasons. One is the reason why it collapsed, and that was a, a photograph was discovered of the presiding judge in the White House with George Bush. And it was suggested, well, if he was made of George Bush, he probably wasn't as neutral as he really should be. He was obviously had to agree with that, so, you know, it was a bit, uh, bit obvious. Um, and the interesting thing is, before he dissolved the case, he put a gagging order on the media, preventing them recording the reason why it had been dissolved. <laughs> the second and more positive, interesting aspect of that case, quite a bit of the evidence had already been heard, and um, just after it was dissolved, one of the jurors approached the, the defendants and said she wanted to be part of any future defence campaign. So obviously the argument was working. <laughs> 
And indeed, after the trial collapsed again, there was a third trial, and they actually won that third trial. The jury found them not guilty. Uh, so that was great, good victory, and it also saved them five years in prison. But going back to 2003, these events happened. There's been the various um, kind of more mass-based uh, direct actions at the airport, and they have an immediate effect. There's, there were four airlines using the airport to ferry U.S. troops through, and three of them publicly announced they were pulling out until the Irish government did something about security at the airport. This is also the point at which the anti-war movement is really building up. Uh, we're coming up to February 15th, and February 15th, I think a million people marched in New York, and 100,000 people marched in Dublin. Now, that's 10% of the population of Dublin. Uh, you know, polls in this period are showing 80% of the population opposed refueling at the airport. So there was no question as to where public opinion was of it. Our analysis, though, was that this, this in itself wasn't going to end refueling, that the government was simply going to ignore this opposition. And indeed, that's what happened. So we decided it was time to try and escalate this process. Um, and what we decided to do was we put out a public call for a mass non-violent direct action to take place at the airport on March the 1st, 2003. And the form that action was to take was basically to reproduce the 8th of October. We wanted people to line up in a big ring, pull the fence down, and go onto the airfields. Um, and the idea was you got three to 5,000 people doing that sort of thing. It would become almost impossible for the government to arrest them all. So they'd be put in this situation where they'd have to ask the U.S. military to stop using the, the airport. In some respects, we were a bit naive at this stage. The first problem was we kind of expected that the uh, media would uh, report what we actually planned. You know, and the statement we put out, not only it was on violence half a dozen times, but had a few references to Gandhi thrown in as well, just to try and make <laughs> things clear. But that's not the way they took it up. They chose to present it as a plant of a huge riot at the airport. Um, the second thing is we thought the mainstream anti-war movements would quietly support what we were doing, or at least wouldn't come out in opposition to it. What we proposed seemed very logical in the context of that time. Now it seemed to be the moment to act. That didn't happen either. They joined in this sort of, oh, this is irresponsible, there's going to be a riot, there's going to be chaos thing. And indeed, the far left in general also joined this chorus. On the Friday of that week, before the demonstration on the Saturday, things got pretty farcical when Sinn Féin, which is the political wing of the Irish Republican Army, went on the radio and said it was advising its members not to go down to the protest because they were worried about the potential for violence. <laughs> um, literally, literally three minutes after that announcement on the radio, my phone rings and it's my mother on the other end. She'd taken part in the big anti-war demonstrations and stuff and she was like, what the hell are you guys planning? Um, and this was the problem we had, because basically after all these sequence of events, a lot of people concluded, well, there's no smoke without fire. So they concluded that, yeah, we must have had some sort of crazy plan. So we didn't get those 3,000 people. Uh, what did happen was about 300 people turned out. Uh, we discovered that, uh, you know, it was no longer low-key protesting down there. They had the riot cops out, they had mounted cops, they had water cannon inside the fence here. And for good measure, the government announced it was going to deploy the army at the airport and somebody, anybody climbing over the fence might get shot. We had a go at it anyway, but we were outnumbered, so what basically happened was about a dozen people got arrested. So... The significance of this, apart from the anti-war struggle, and in fact in the aftermath the mainstream anti-war movement was going to split and the majority was going to also end up supporting direct action at the airport, was the actual growth of the anarchist movements alongside this. Uh, if you go back to the period I start, we have half a dozen people and a dozen people and that's pretty much the movement. Here we have 300 people taking part in this action and because of the intense pressure on them, most of those people have played a role in actually organising things. So it's a very much bigger movement. The next test of this was to be the following year, and that was when the summit protests came to town. Uh, May 8, 2004, there was a European Union summit in Dublin. Um, these were happening at this stage every 10 years because it's rotated around Europe, and I'd been part of a group of about a dozen people who tried to protest the previous one. And we kind of, that consisted purely of us trying to get to the side of the road as the cars drove by with placards. A couple of dozen police descend and they'll shove us out of the way, and it's pretty invisible. This time around, though, with the growth of summit protesting, we thought things could be different. So at the start of this, an important decision was made that we weren't going to focus on trying to get people internationally to come to Ireland for the protest. And the reason we made that decision was we were relatively small groups of people, and we knew that if that's the way we went, we'd have to put a lot of resources into trying to house people and feed them and all that sort of thing. And instead, what we decided to do was to try and mobilise the population of the city itself. That was going to be our main focus. Out of the anti-war experience, uh, we knew not to rely on the media for that, so the main thing we did is we did 50,000 copies of a you know, glossy colour leaflet that explained what was wrong with the 
neoliberal direction of the European Union and tied it into the issues people have been fighting on. Things like the uh, struggle against the uh, water tax, the bin tax and also the uh, militarisation. And we went door to door with those leaflets all over Dublin, in particular in the areas where the uh, protest was going to be happening or where we were going to be trying to march to. The idea basically was that at least that way a very large percentage of the population of the city would have an idea of what it was all about and hopefully would come out. We went wrong about the media. Media coverage in the lead-up to the summit was the usual kind of mad, mad stuff. Uh, we, you know, kind of focused on a secret plan to burn the city down, and <laughs> the idea that, you know, there's going to be thousands and thousands of foreign troublemakers, Genoa veterans, Italians, all this sort of thing descending on the country. So the other thing we'd done is we expected this, and we set up a media group that consisted of four, four press spokespeople and about half a dozen people to help train them, and they were given two missions. One was to try and diffuse and ridicule this sort of story. And the reason we wanted to do that is we, know what, we knew what the cops were just trying to do was create an atmosphere where they could suppress any demonstration that happened and people would be grateful to them for saving the city. And the second thing we were told them was they had to do this in a way that didn't cause divisions within the movement. We didn't want the situation where they were manipulated into appearing to condemn what somebody else might have been planning. So they were the two kind of mandates. Um, they did a great job of that. Uh, Right before the summit, uh, one of the women got onto the Late Late Show, that television show I was talking about. They put her on between two big security correspondents or experts from the papers, and she made complete idiots out of them. And uh, that anarchist organiser by night, she teaches her children by day, that, that came out after that. That was her they were then going after. That, uh, that was the newspaper that one of those so-called experts came from. Again, in the lead-up to the summit, the cops decided to give us a hand. And what they did was they announced a de facto ban on our main demonstration. In fact, they said anybody who tried to even get to the point we were forming up at was going to be arrested. Uh, and anybody who tried to march down there would have their right cops sent in to break them up, and then they'd all be arrested. So that meant we were also able to sort of start appealing to people to come out on, civil liberty, on a civil liberties basis, you know. Uh, and people were getting pissed off anyway because you had this mad militarization of the city, you had police checkpoints everywhere, you know, all those sort of annoyances. So on the day itself, we had a, a planned set of demonstrations that escalated from the early morning to the late afternoon, and that worked well because there was live radio coverage of all this, so it meant people were getting a developing picture of things through the day. And then in the evening, uh, we cancelled that original plan for the march and that former point, and we said instead we're going to have a mass meeting outside the GPO on O'Connell Street in Dublin, which is right in the city centre, and that meeting is going to decide whether or not uh, we're going to march on the summit protest. Oh, sorry, on the summit. Uh, so five to 6,000 people turn up for the meeting, uh, we have a discussion, we have a vote, and thankfully everybody votes to actually march. It would have been very embarrassing if they voted to go home. We got about, yeah, about 5,000 odd people marched. We had agreed in advance we weren't going to initiate confrontation with the police, so our main strategy was to go somewhere they didn't expect us to go. And that worked really well because they put all their forces down at the original former point. Dublin's an old city, lots of narrow, twisty streets, and when they tried to move, they got caught up in this traffic jam with their own creation of water cannon, cars, you know, uh, vans, and all that sort of stuff. So we actually covered six miles and got to within about 200 metres of the uh, helicopter pads they were using to bring the delegates in and out of, uh, and then they finally caught up with us with all the water cannon and ride cops and all the rest. So in terms of numbers, that was the uh, biggest uh, event, right? And there's a couple of reasons for that, but the main reason, we were part of a, you know, there's an international kind of discussion about summit protests was going on in this period, and it was reflected in Dublin. It was kind of, you know, how useful are summit protests? Do they build anything locally, or are they just kind of, you know, adrenaline-fueled holidays for hyperactivists who, as soon as one is over, want to go rushing off to the next one? So we were part of that discussion, and it, we didn't really take one poll or the other of it, uh, but what did happen is we started to downplay the sort of spectacular protest stuff. Uh, we did go to Glen Eagles, we sent a couple of busloads of people there, that, that was the G8 summit a couple of years later, and when George Bush was in Shannon, we went, went to that as well. Uh, but what happened instead was that there was a lot more focus put on local organising projects, and these have taken a number of forms. One important one... Uh, was Dublin has a huge property boom. Your property, the cheapest housing in the city of Dublin is about $600,000. Rents and stuff like that have gone up in the court. And what that has done is it's squeezed out all sorts of alternative or uh, social or political spaces. So it's become very hard even, say, to put a, a punk gig on. But it's become much more difficult to hold political meetings. Uh, so there was a social centre project called Show Must Free set up. Uh, also, squatting is very illegal in Ireland. You just get chucked in prison if, if you do it publicly.
And the nature of that was they wanted to get lots of people to pay $10, $15 a month into a bank account and use that money to rent a building. And they've done that now on three occasions. Uh, two of those buildings have been lost after seven or eight months because the cops were able to get them closed down by enforcing pretty obscure fire safety regulations that they don't bother enforcing most of the rest of the city. Uh, for instance, you're not meant to have furniture that's over three years old. Uh, so obviously, you kind of activist group without a lot of resources, that's pretty difficult. Um, a lot of the women who'd been involved in the process uh, took the initiative of forming the Revolutionary Anarchist Feminist Group, or RAG, um, and they've done a load of things, meetings and stuff, but they also publish uh, a magazine called The Rag. If you Google it, you'll find two issues online, and the third one's coming out at the moment. Around this as well, another issue, initiative was to return to pro-choice struggle. Now, abortion continues to be illegal in Ireland, but in the 90s, after the X case, we won a minor victory. Uh, basically, the reason we'd been leafleting the day that story broke uh, was because it was also illegal to provide contact details for abortion clinics in England, right? So we were on the street leafleting with these contact details. Uh, the theory basically was we'd get prosecuted and then we'd kind of try and build a campaign around defending ourselves. Uh, but the state at the time was too smart to do that. Um, in the, after the X case, there's a referendum and there's two minor victories. Uh, one is the decision that, yes, indeed, there is a right to travel, so there were going to be no more injunctions. Uh, and the second one was they made it legal for a doctor to provide that information. So the anti-choice movement reacted in a number of ways, and one of the ways they reacted was they set up fake um, advice centres that would advertise as if they would uh, give non-directive counselling, and if a woman opted for an abortion at the end of that, they'd provide these contact details. In reality, what they were about was luring women into a process of delay. So they'd be told to come back in three or four weeks, and then they'd be told to come back in two weeks. Now, you can get a legal abortion in England up to 16 to 18 weeks, so the purpose of that was to, to try and delay things enough so that that became impossible. Um, so we started picketing these places, uh, basically to highlight their existence so people would be more cautious. Uh, the signage on this is put up in the morning of the demonstration, and they take it down again in the afternoon. Uh, this one's normally called the Women's Action Centre. Um, other projects people were involved in were stuff like community gardens, and I had that newspaper headline in connection to that. Another area was workplace organising. Ireland, like a lot of countries, has a declining union membership, and young and migrant workers uh, tend not to come into contact with unions unless they enter an already well-organised workplace. Um, we also, there's also a lot of migration to Ireland at the moment, and we uh, anecdotally discovered that a lot of employers were not giving people legal rights like minimum wage, holiday pay, sick pay, and also breaking health and safety legislation. And they were doing that because they reckoned that people who didn't have English as a first language would be isolated enough that they wouldn't discover what their rights were. So one of these initiatives was the Stand Up For Your Rights campaign, and what that consisted of was a multilingual leaflet that explained these things, um, and then contact details for the various unions that organised in retail, and 40 or 50 of us would go out to a shopping mall or into the city centre where the shopping streets were, go through and leaflet everybody who was working in those places. Uh, also in this period, there was a small breakaway union formed called the Independent Workers' Union um, that wanted to return to a more militant trade unionism, and uh, a lot of the younger people who went already organised got involved in that. There's no huge stories coming out of those. Uh, one interesting one, though, is through them we made contact with... Uh, some Polish workers who were working in the warehouses of the major supermarket chain. Uh, they were temp workers, and they were being paid less than the Irish workers they worked alongside. They weren't being offered permanent positions when they came up, and they were being subject to constant speed-up. So they'd start off and be told they have to move 60 or 70 boxes an hour, then it would be 100, then it would be 150. Um, so they organised their wildcat strike in the warehouses, and with them we organised uh, solidarity pickets of the retail outlets of the stores, and they in fact spread to um, uh, Britain and Germany where the same supermarket is based. So I'm not going to talk about everything that was going on in this period, and there's two reasons for that. One is time, um, but the other one is that in comparison with that period I start with, with the two small groups, a dozen people, half a dozen people, I mean back then I knew everybody, I, I knew their names, I knew their pets' names, I slept on all their couches, and we were all probably a little bit sick of the sight of each other. Whereas today, we're talking about a movement that involves hundreds of people, and I'm pretty sure there's stuff going on that I'm just unaware of. I am going to end up by talking about one other struggle. Um, community struggles have obviously played a fairly major part, uh, and most of those have been urban. So the last one I'm going to talk about is Rossport, which is a rural struggle. 
Now, if you think of the map of Ireland as looking a bit like a teddy bear, uh, then the bit where the arms stick out into the Atlantic, right, and at the very tip of those arms, that's where Rossport is located. It's very isolated. It's about a seven-hour bus journey from Dublin if you hire a bus and you go out there, and we've done that a few times. So what's happening at Rossport is um, Shell have managed to get their hands on a natural gas field that's offshore there, and uh, rather than doing the usual thing with such fields, which is to build an offshore refinery, process the gas, clean it up, and then pump it ashore at a relatively low pressure, uh, what they want to do to save $150 million is build an experimental high-pressure gas pipeline uh, that will run through the village of Rossport itself. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for a gas pipeline explosion, right, you'll see that these things fail, and when they do so, they're really dangerous. You have fireballs two or three hundred yards in diameter. But they want to run this within 70 yards of people's houses. Uh, what's more, they want to uh, run it so the house is by the sea and the pipeline's a little bit in, in, inland. So in fact, if something went wrong to escape, you'd have to cross the pipeline itself. As you might understand, the locals aren't terribly keen on this. Um, and initially, they tried the normal processes of lobbying local politicians or looking for legal routes to oppose this project. But they discovered that Shell in the previous decade had basically bought e absolutely everybody they needed to and had got whatever laws they needed passed. Um, they also discovered people kept telling them it was safe, you know, passed all these sort of safety tests. So they were wondering about this. And it's kind of an interesting story. The way these projects are deemed safe is, is if they won't kill more than one person in a million. I mean, that kind of sounds, sounds somewhat reasonable initially, right? And then you start to break the maths down. So it's expected this pipeline will last 40 years. There's 5 million people on the island of Ireland. So you multiply the 5 by the 40 and you get 200, right? Um, the problem is if you live in Rossport is the population is 97. So in fact, uh, the pipeline could kill everyone twice, have six people left over, and we still pass those safety tests. Um, you can see why people were a bit worried about this. So as this struggle escalated, anarchists from the nearest city, which is Galway, they were involved in the grassroots gathering, went down there and said, look, can we give you help in, in terms of this? And the answer was yes. And out of this came the Rossport Solidarity Camp. Now, the idea of the camp was not that the anarchists would go down there as super activists and kind of, you know, do all these crazy direct actions on behalf of the locals and win the struggle for them, but rather it was to provide infrastructure that enabled a few people to live there permanently and enter into the kind of local community, the debates and discussions about tactics, and when actions were going to happen meant that a lot more of us could go down there, would have somewhere to sleep, and somewhere where we could uh, cook and stuff. Um, so... The struggle starts to escalate about three years ago, uh, and what happens is Shell wants to start work, and the first thing they want to do is survey the route of the pipeline. Now, six of the local small farmers said, no, nope, you're not coming onto our land to survey the pipeline. But Shell have got this law passed that basically says they've automatic access. So they take an injunction out against these six, um, and under it they get five of them jailed indefinitely. Now, the reason it's five is they were, there were five men and a woman, right? So, although they're known as the Rossport Five, it should really be the Rossport Six. And Shell obviously decided that getting the woman jailed as well would just generate more opposition to the to program, so they didn't go after her. Uh, the thinking was pretty obviously that these guys would be put in jail, they'd be terrified, so they'd do what they had to do to get out, which was to say sorry and that they'd never do it again. Uh, that didn't work out. Uh, they stayed in jail for three months, and on the 94th day, uh, Shell went back into the courts, and the context was an escalating set of protests, both nationally and in the county they're from, which is Mayo. Uh, Shell go back into the courts and say, okay, we've changed our mind, can we get them released? This was also going to be significant in another way, because, at this, uh, because of this, it appears Shell decided that actually getting people arrested was a bad idea. Uh, it just built opposition. So they seem to have gone to the cops or the government at this stage and said, can you see if you can avoid arresting people in the future? 2006, and construction of the refinery starts in a serious way. Uh, so the locals start organizing blockades of that construction, and what the state responds with is they move 200 cops down there on a permanent basis. Now, again, population of 97, 200 cops, that's a pretty impressive occupation. And the purpose of that was to stop any effective protest. You could you know, stand by the side of the road with a placard, but you couldn't blockade the refinery, you couldn't try and block the trucks going into the refinery, and you couldn't do mass trespasses on the refinery itself. All of those things are stuff we've been doing over the last couple of years. Because the uh, police don't um, seem to have this no arrest instruction, uh, the way of dealing with this is through numbers and through violence. And again, one of the videos I showed out there 
uh, which was kind of, most of it was in the dark and the cops were wearing fluorescent jackets, so it might have been a bit hard to follow what was going on, were various examples of this. So they kind of, they baton charge people, they pick people up off the road, they throw them 15 foot into ditches, they throw people into barbed wire fences, and uh, you'll also have noticed at one stage a guy who kind of plain clothes was captioned as Sergeant O'Reilly, and he was a really interesting character because at the start of the process that they deployed him, he was some sort of tactical specialist, Kung Fu nut or something, and his thing was he'd identify the people he thought were the leaders and he'd go over and he'd do maybe pressure point pinches on them or slide punches and kind of try and take them out of the equation. Uh, we took him out, though, by putting his photograph all over indie media. Mainstream press started taking an interest in this weirdness, and they pulled him out, and he's stuck in the teacher or the guard at training college now. <laughs> um, those protests continued, and they're still continuing. One of the other interesting aspects of this struggle is the links the locals have made with similar struggles elsewhere. Uh, this example is a mural uh, next to one of the barns, which commemorates the execution of, uh, of six Nigerians back in the 1990s who were struggling against Shell. Uh, in terms of the Solidarity Camp, we've used that to hold conferences, and um, people have come there from the uh, gas struggle in Bolivia as well. So, a final note on this. I left Dublin nine months ago, and just before I left in Dublin, we thought of a new tactic. Uh, obviously, all these police checkpoints and things make life in Rossport very difficult. So we thought, well, look, why don't we try and uh, make things a bit difficult for the people in the Shell headquarters based in Dublin? So what we were doing was once a week we were going to go down and we'd blockade the headquarters to stop them getting in. So 7 o'clock in the morning, 30 or 40 of us would go down there. Uh, you know, they'd arrive in with their cars, trying to get into the car park. We'd put ourselves in front of the cars, and the cops would then come along and try and shove us out of the way. The interesting thing about this is this, what appears to be this no-arrest thing. Um, We'd normally succeed, and then we'd separate into two lines, kind of stand there staring at each other until the next car arrived. Five or ten minutes later, this would be repeated. This would go on for three or four hours. This photograph, this photograph is from the fourth week we were doing this. This is just before I left the country. Nobody was arrested in the course of this, not one of us. Uh, and obviously, that's not really what you'd expect. You know, you'd imagine you'd do that the first time, and then you're in the back of the van on the way down the police station. So that's kind of a summary of the growth of anarchism. Uh, and of, of anarchist involvement in social struggles in the last uh, 10 years, and importantly, the growth of the movement in, in, in connection with that. I don't think there's anything particularly unique about the Irish situation that allowed this to happen. In fact, I think it comes down to three pretty simple reasons. The first of these was uh, the creation of an anarchist movement that was increasingly outward-looking and you know, seeking ways to communicate with ordinary people, whether that was through dealing with the media, despite all the problems with it, or whether it was through our own publications. Uh, I talked about the kind of leafleting we did around the summit. We also did that a number of times around other issues. Uh, another example of the same sort of thing is my own organization. It does a, a, a newspaper every two months. We do 10,000 copies of it. It's free. And what we do is we go door to door in the areas where we live and we distribute it that way. So where I'm from in Dublin where there's a concentration of us, if you put a pin in a map, within about three quarters of a mile, everybody in that district gets one of those papers every two months. I have had two sample copies that are travelling around with me and are getting somewhat tattered, but I'll, I'll pass them around so that people can have a look and pick them up at the end. Um, a second key thing was how we dealt with differences within the movement. And the grassroots gathering was particularly important in that respect, because what we managed to create was a kind of culture of debate where people who had differences, who had, had disagreements, would debate these things out in the context of the gathering, but at the end of it were still capable of working together and planning common actions, and, you know, didn't get in a, a, a sniff uh, because people disagreed with each other. That was really essential in terms of a lot of the things I'm talking about because it gave us the critical mass of people that could actually set out to, to, to achieve these things. Um, and the third thing we had uh, was those two groups I keep kind of taking the piss out of at the start. A dozen people, half a dozen people. And what they could bring to it was an experience of organising from stuff like the X case, from stuff like that first bin tax campaign, uh, and also the resources that enabled things like the grassroots gathering to get off the ground in the first place and to be put, put, put back together again in the aftermath. Um, okay, so that's it. That's the uh, kind of anarchist movement in Ireland and what's been happening in the last ten years. And hopefully people will have questions and stuff. And I've won announcement to start with, I think. So, was it you going to do it? Or? Yeah, as far as this will be workshop, um, we have 115 called Forming an Anarchist. Was it Forming the Necessity for an Anarchist?
lot of experience going in. He's been in a lot of different interface organizations internationally now, and uh, in Canada and in Ireland. And he's been, as part of his speaking tour, he's been meeting with different levels, like different collectives and individuals all over the country. And I think he's going to have a lot to contribute to the idea of maybe what's possible for Chicago now, what's already happened, so that we can bring to it. And then, you know, maybe kind of begin some conversations about how we can harness the energy of this conference and gathering to maybe bring new projects out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a guy called Damien. Uh, yeah, he, he actually emailed me about four weeks back saying he was visiting because I was doing a meeting in Richmond like this and he was going to be going through Richmond, so he was, he was seeking local contacts, basically. But yeah, there, he got turned back at the airport. He was coming from Warsaw, actually, at the time, and sent back, despite the fact that they were found not guilty, so he actually didn't have a conviction. Uh, but yeah, that happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, can I get somebody else to... Somebody come up and facilitate because it's going to be hard for me to keep track of so many hands. Look. Um, on the, uh, you had the protest where the media said that you were going to have this big uh, riot, and so you had a meeting instead, um, and then you marched from there. How did you get you know, all these people that you leafleted? How did you get that information out so fast to change your location? Oh, well, basically, the intensity of the media coverage of stuff was such that they were reporting our plans. You know? okay. uh, so, and also, uh, the other important thing was Irish indie media. Uh, Irish indie media is very, very successful. Its viewing figures suggest maybe 10% of the population look at it once a month. And if you're any way active whatsoever, you basically know, if you look there, you'll know what the latest details are. So we had a constant stream of updates uh, that were going out there. But the, yeah, because we were protesting during the day, that meant there was kind of live radio coverage all day of, oh, now they're doing this, and now they're doing that. So, you know, it, all those things, I think, helped uh, people know what was going on. Okay, and can we have all hands up for just one second? <laughs> um, do we want to just go maybe oh, around the room? So you just okay, and then we're just gonna do. I think we're just gonna have to go around that way if people are okay with that. Okay, well, why don't you just go then? All right. Well, I, I, I have three things, and you can feel free to give short or non-existing answers to any of them. There's a lot. One is I'm curious. Uh, a lot of the actions you described seemed like they were built on the assumption that arrests were either probable and or desirable. And I'm curious about legal strategies and whether you felt like even in the cases where people were successfully acquitted, whether that resulted in a drain on resources that could have been better used elsewhere. Second question would be about uh, as the movement has grown and presumably the organizations have grown, how has the internal organization of those groupings changed? Um, to accommodate larger numbers. Uh, and the third would be, to the extent that you're using sort of broad appeals to things like when you were talking about using the civil liberties angle on, on protests, how have you been able to forestall a sort of diffusion of the politics that you guys want to bring to the struggle um, in, in ways that, you know, so that it doesn't get basically co-opted by reference elements, I guess. Those are three huge areas of, of <laughs> question, and you can, you can pass on any of them. Uh, well, the first one, uh, in terms of most of the stuff I've been involved in organizing, we don't organize with the intention of getting arrested. Um, inevitably, if you're doing stuff like I'm, I'm talking about doing, there's a risk of arrest. But uh, we're, kind of, we're not into the, you know, kind of chaining yourself together, sitting in a road and waiting until the cops pull us off. Some people have done that sort of stuff as well, and obviously the plowshare stuff was the kind of purest form of that sort of thing, where you actually went and found the police and, and handed yourself over. Uh, but in general, yeah, I mean, the problem with lots of arrests is even if people aren't found guilty, they're doing multiple court appearances in relation to Shannon. If you arrest and you're from Dublin, that means you have to get all the way down to Shannon, you know, for five minutes and then all the way back. So the, those things do drain resources. And it did become an issue because we probably had 60 people arrested down there all together over a few months, and... You're not talking about a huge movement. That was probably 20%. I'm forgetting your three questions. Quickly, what was the second one? The second one was about organization change. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. 
Right, so um, I, I just talked about my own group in relation to that. Uh, we started off this period as a small group of 10 people, so a lot of our, uh, our main organizational thing we had was once, uh, twice a year we met up at a conference and we discussed things, voted on things, uh, drew up position papers, and then that was the policy we would implement. We really just were based in Dublin, we were one member in court, so in between, effectively, Dublin made a decision and the court guy kind of went along with it or not. Um, nowadays, we've about 70 members, we've five branches, three in Dublin, one in Cork, one in Belfast. So as well as that conference, the other thing we have is what we call a delegate council. And what that means is um, once a month, we have a period where members can draw motions that go to every single branch. They're voted on, and then each branch sends a delegate to a meeting, and they carry the exact votes from each branch. So that decides policy between conferences. Conferences remain the kind of main policy-making body, so that delegate council can only kind of make minor adjustments. They remain open to every member to put motions in to vote at and attend. They happen every six months. And if you look at our website, basically, you'll find this big archive of the policy we've agreed. I mean, our idea, basically, is by agreeing a lot of stuff in advance and in detail, it means that when an issue comes up, pretty much all the branches can immediately act on it and will act more or less in concert with each other because we've already agreed a lot of the basics of stuff. So that's the kind of way we organize it. And third question? About how do you... How do you oh, I got it. For your yeah. politics in the midst of broadening structure. Yeah, I, I think our general approach is that um, when we're approaching struggles, what we're interested in is how to win them, right? Uh, how much can we demand and that be something that can be won? We don't get too caught up as to whether or not a demand is revolutionary or reformist. And I think the reality is, in terms of almost all, you know, unless you're talking about a revolution, they're all reformists, you know, just more or less than each other. It's not irrelevant, but it's not where we spend most of the time. Uh, our, kind of our approach is much more one of what's important is the methodology that's been used. Is it one that's based on lobbying politicians and all that sort of stuff, which is of very limited use or no use, or is it one that's based on mass assemblies, or, sorry, direct action? Uh, is it one that's based on having a little committee that makes the decisions, or is it one that's based on mass assemblies and, and some sort of direct democracy? So really, in terms of our approach to that, it's, we concentrate on those second set of questions because we think the experience of, of winning and the experience of winning in the context for the, those are the methods you use are what's going to bring people into the movement. You know, if you see it working, if you see our methods working, then you're going to be interested in taking part. Okay, and uh, we have 15 minutes left, I think, so everyone maybe stick to one question. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, my question is, I just, uh, you said at the end, uh, what was it, uh, the reasons for success, well, one was to uh, communicate with uh, folks, the other was to sort of create a culture of debate, what was the third one? The third one was the, 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 the kind of small organizations that didn't have much numbers, but did have resources and did have experience. Okay. Uh, so concretely it meant with the first grassroots gatherings, uh, we were able to put the, cover the course of putting those together and put network people together in the initial sense. What sort of stuff does it cover? Oh, uh, well, basically anything that's, that's relevant to what we do. So, uh, for instance, our approach to the struggle for abortion rights, um, uh, our analysis of imperialism in Ireland, and I didn't get into that whole question because that's a whole other meeting, but, you know, like Ireland is partitioned and what our analysis of that is, what, what should be done around it. Uh, technical documents about how we publish our paper, you know, what the role of the different, you know, the editorial group is, what, what decisions they can make, what they can't make. Um, 
yeah, so that, that kind of, you know, what the role of an anarchist organisation is as one of the long ones. What should we be doing in relation to trade union activity? All those sort of questions so that everybody has an idea of what, what collectively we're trying to implement. And how do you go about making these large large With, well, okay, so if we take something like those community struggles I talked about, the first things that happened with those, well, the first thing was the formation of a coalition of the existing left Republican and, and, and uh, anti authoritarian groups. Um, and then what we would be doing is we'd be going door-to-door in the housing states with leaflets that uh, urged people not to give in to pressure and pay, had a contact telephone number for the campaign, and perhaps called a local organizing meeting. Uh, the contact number actually was kind of interesting because initially we got no calls whatsoever with those. These are struggles that built over three years. But three years down the line, the phones would be hopping off the, you know, they'd be going crazy. And you realise that loads of people had these pins in their fridges or their kitchen door or whatever uh, for later use. Uh, yeah, then ideally what would happen is we'd have a local meeting and what at least the anarchist end of the movement would hope would come out of that local meeting would be a local organising group that would take over the organisation in that area and allow the activists who didn't live in the area, you know, often some of them did of course, but the other people to move on and start organising the next set. So that was done over a period of two or three years, which meant by the time we got to, you know, the point where they tried to cut off water, the point where they were uh, stopped collecting bins, you already had thousands of people who had been at meetings, hundreds of people who had played some active role in organisation, and tens of thousands of people who had a pretty good idea of what was meant to happen uh, once they happened. Uh, so you, we weren't relying, relying on spontaneous action at, at that end point. People were pretty clued in. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a, a, a little bit in detail about sports solidarity. Um, how, how long was that set up before it started functioning as a base for direct action mobilization? Um, how is it still up and how long has it been up? And how well is it, uh, or like, what has its integration for the community? Okay, so it, it started off about four years ago. Um, and basically based on contact with one, one sympathetic member of the campaign, who, a small farmer who allowed us to set up on a piece of bog land uh, that was part of his farm. Um, at that stage, a good part, it was fairly small, and a good part of it was people making uh, the kind of initial wider contacts with the community. Uh, the following summer, you know, and that, so that's after a period of time, as before there was a lot of action happening around the campaign, those contacts had been made, and it was pointed out to us that there was a big piece of common land that was actually directly at the point the uh, uh, pipeline was due to come ashore. So the location was moved to there, and that's the photograph I showed you, was some of the, build, some of the, the structure that was built there. Actually, there was additional stuff. It was a big area. Um, and so that's the point at which a lot of people start to go down there. We start to have conferences down there, and there starts to be a lot of contact uh, between the locals. I mean, it's probably important to say the locals weren't a homogenous community, you know, so that everybody had exactly the same idea about what they wanted to do. There were significant disagreements within it between people who wanted a sort of electoral road and trying to get a politician elected to change things, and people who said, no, we need to actually be taking action because we can't trust the politicians. So obviously we were identifying with that side of, of the debate. Uh, as the struggle has progressed, that's where most people have ended up because the electoral route, of course, didn't work out very well. Um, the camp no longer exists. They finally managed to evict it last summer. Uh, but by that stage, uh, enough contact had been built up with enough locals that uh, there's still a fair bit of activity where people have just moved into houses down there. Uh, and again, people can mobilise that and go down. Um, but yes, so that's... I think movements are often sustained. Uh, I haven't really seen too many that have been sustained long term uh, by the building of affinity groups and relationships. And you touched on that a little bit about talking about resolving differences. Can you expand on that and whether or not your movement is seriously considering deeply going into that relationship building, which I see as really the we're not going to use coercive structures, and it, it really it has to be that has, it has to be the building block of the relationship between each other. Um, yeah, I mean, we do a number of things that are designed that way. One which actually does not much formal political activity around at all is most years we have an anarchist summer camp. And that basically consists of us all going somewhere 
uh, setting up camp on a piece of land. I think one of the pictures out there with the pirate flag above it was, was one of those things. And we spend the weekend kind of, you know, cooking, uh, being island, drinking, singing songs, and hill walking, uh, and doing that sort of stuff. And that's kind of building contact between individuals. Uh, on a more political level, the grassroots gatherings played that function. You know, they were a very easy thing to go to. It was, a, you know, just a set of discussions. There's no membership list. Uh, they're very informal in terms of the way they organize. And they also move from city to city. So that was important because, okay, if you don't do it in Dublin, it's going to be a bit smaller, but you'll get people in the regional cities that wouldn't come to Dublin. Uh, so that, that has, I mean, we've had 10 of those so far. The 12th will take place in Dublin this June. Oh, so that must be 11. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's an ongoing process. More recently, we've initiated an anarchist book fair in Dublin, and there's also been one initiated in Belfast. And again, like a book fair is about the easiest thing in the world. If you're, you know, you're kind of anarchist curious or something, you want to check it out, then you can, you know, walk, go into a book fair. It's not much of a challenge. Uh, that's been quite successful. The last one in Dublin had about 800 people on it. Uh, yeah, so that's one definite wing of things. I think the other one is also the, the existence of, of, of permanent organizations like my own over 24 years means that one of the problems you can have with network and loose forms of organization is often they break down. So with the grassroots gathering, it's so informal that it doesn't even have a permanent structure to it at all. So at the end of each grassroots gathering, as well as planning actions, we get a set of people to volunteer to organize the next one. That's a great way of keeping it informal. The problem you sometimes have is, for one reason or another, those people flake out and the next one doesn't happen. So at that stage, the kind of existing organizations will normally step in and reinitiate things and get the, get the next one happening again and move it forward. So, uh, you know, we've avoided, I mean, I think one of the things we've done in Ireland is we've avoided some of the stupid debates people have. So we don't have a this method of organization versus this method of organization debate. We sort of recognize that different forms have different suitabilities and achieve different things. <coughs> Okay, so I didn't touch on that at all. That's partly because to do it justice would be an hour in itself, right? Uh, people are probably aware of the general outline. Um, we'd, uh, coming out of a peaceful civil rights movement in the 1960s in Ireland that was consciously modelled on the civil rights movement here. Uh, in Ireland, it was suppressed by the military in the north, uh, culminating in Bloody Sunday in 1972 when 14 protesters were shot dead. And actually, the picture I used of the WSM initially was from the, the annual commemoration up there. That ended up then in, in 30 years of military struggle and the last 10 years uh, a peace process and ceasefire. Um, it, again, in terms of the big picture, one of the interesting things was that the, um, the Republican movement increasingly identified as a left-wing international anti-imperialist movement in the 1980s. Uh, so they made a lot of links with the kind of likes of the PLO, the ANC, uh, the Sandinistas, and all that sort of thing. But part of the price of the peace process has been, rather than meeting with those sort of organizations, uh, Jerry Adams has been going to the White House and meeting with George Bush. So those are the kind of photographs you'll see. And while that movement, the mainstream of the Sinn Féin, maintains some of its radical uh, language, it's actually dropped a lot of it. It no longer talks about socialism, it no longer talks about a workers' republic and stuff. You know, it talks about a community of equals and that sort of thing. So in that context, uh, there's quite a lot of groups have split off. Some of those have relationships with the anarchist movement. There's also some Republicans have, have joined the anarchist movement in Ireland. Um, I think there's a, an interesting... I mean, the perspective of my organization was that the ceasefire was a good thing uh, because the military struggle wasn't going anywhere, it was just getting people killed, um, uh, but that the peace process was a bit of a disaster. Part of the problem with the peace process is it cements sectarian divisions. It's all based on a head count of Catholics, a head count of Protestants, and they've done something like they did in Lebanon, you know, so it just keeps that sort of division going. Um, but... Uh, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, it's very hard to do briefly, but that's kind of, I think, where things are now. Okay, well, I think we could probably do like one or two more questions, and also Andrew is going to be speaking on the plenary that's going to be happening after the last workshop, so you'll have the opportunity to go and hear more about some of the different kinds of work he's done, and maybe ask more questions then, too. So, one, and do we want to do one more afterwards? Okay, and you yeah. uh, I I'm sure you're pretty aware that in North America here we have a, we have a, a lot of divisions in the anarchist movement, particularly between uh, 
uh, reds and greens. And I wonder if you have the same sort of uh, sort of traditions in Ireland and how you deal with it. Uh, okay, so that red green division I don't find very useful, right? Um, I mean, I think if you looked, in terms of the North American spectrum, the group I'm from would be seen as red, right? But obviously, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about, particularly Rossport, would be seen as being green. So, I think that's kind of some sort of artificial thing that people generated because it, it suited their own interests. Um, in terms of the sort of movement we built, it, it, it you know, unites anti-authoritarian groups across that spectrum. My own organization probably being at one end of it. Uh, sort of the other end, there's a, a student's environmental direct action group called Blue Shock that uh, had previously been doing a lot of work around direct action against nuclear power stations in Britain um, and, and that sort of stuff. So I think, as I said, I think the main thing we did was to, you know, try and avoid uh, meaningless polarizing debates. Uh, where there was no particular need for them, uh, try and work out a basis of unity that 98% of, of anti-authoritarians could come along with. I mean, like the grassroots gathering statement I had up, you'd get the odd person who wouldn't agree with that and would choose not to be part of it, that's fine. But the idea was to try and unite most people around that. So that's kind of how we dealt with it. Okay, our last question. Oh, here, just wait, since uh, Kathy hasn't been able to ask a question yet, why don't you do the last okay. one? In direct response to what you just said about uniting people, I mean, this, this might also be like a specifically American question that's not relevant, but um, you find that having the, having the term worker in your name, uh, does it alienate certain people? Does it attract or fail to attract other people? Um, um. I hear that with you. I think, I think it, the problem with names is you always get some people who like a particular name and other people who don't. <laughs> um, I think our, our name is meant to kind of appeal to people who identify class politics as being important and something they want to work around, and also be general enough so that it's kind of, it won't necessarily frighten people off in that sort of general sense. It's kind of, you know, it's a kind of general enough name. But I think, yeah, names are always, uh, it's always tricky. I mean, I'm involved in Ontario in, in putting together an organization there, and we decided to call ourselves Common Course which is a more general sort of thing as well. People come up with diff different sort of names. But, uh, yeah, I always think it's probably not worth fixating on them too much because you can spend a hell of a lot of time trying to sort out names. But I kind of think it's more important to sort out what it is you want to do. different areas depending on the sort of struggles we're talking about. Um, I mean, overwhelmingly working class in the sense of people who work for a living, not people who have capital or you know, people who have small shops or whatever. Um, some of them more of a student bias than others. Uh, some of the community-based campaigns was noticeable that a lot of the key activists were pensioners. Uh, you know, in terms of the mobilizations, that's visible in some of the photographs I used. Uh, in terms of the anarchist movement, I mean, my own group, the youngest person is probably 15 or 16, and the oldest is, like, he's kind of secretive about his age, but I guess he's about 60. <laughs> uh, you know, so we cover that sort of spectrum. Because there's been a lot of growth recently, of course, there's more people at the younger end. Uh, but it is a pretty an intergenerational movement. Um, one of the things about the, the movements in Ireland as well is you don't have as much transience as, as exists in the US where people move cities all the time. So people tend to be in the same space for a longer time. So I think that helps a lot and that there's a continuity of experience. People are aware of what happened 10 years ago, what happened 20 years ago, what happened 30 years ago, uh, and are able to sort of develop on that in a long-term basis. Thank you. Okay, it's time. So. Thank you. Thank you, thank you organizers for giving me a chance to talk to you.